when it comes to the policyholder, what I learned is that when you have an insurance that is pretty good, it's pretty robust, you know, uh, those insurance companies will allot anywhere from 25% to 30% of the property value in temporary housing funding. What? What's up, everybody? My name is Mike Shogren here with my co-host, Emmanuel Pani. We're part of a group of specialized real estate investors you've probably never heard of. We didn't start with deep pockets or wealthy families, and we don't rely on 401ks, mutual funds, or traditional real estate investing. In fact, many of us don't even own the properties that fund our freedom. If you ask the money experts out there, they'd say what we do is impossible, yet it's happening every single day. It's happening through a new niche called short-term rentals. We are Short-Term Rental Nation, and these are our secrets. All right. What's going on, STR Nation? Welcome back to another episode of the Short-Term Rental Secrets Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Shogren, here with my main man and brother from another mother, Mr. Emmanuel Pani. What's up, B? My brother, so good to see you. We're both in different offices, so our images are a little bit messed up. I'm hoping to get my stuff kind of figured out by next week. I do love this blue wall that you have behind this. Is it blue? Almost yeah, so I we, we got a new office. I'll do a... Uh, I'll do a little behind the scenes tour on Instagram or something and show mm -hmm. you guys, but I got a new office and basically set it up to like record content. So we did like this whole, it's beautiful. It's like all paneled. It gets an old historic building. George Washington stayed here back in the day when it was like an inn and now they convert it to offices, but I painted it blue, added some like more modern stuff. And I've got a couple desks and tables and whiteboards and lighting and all sorts of stuff. So we can film a lot more content in here, which, mm -hmm. We've been going to town with my man, Danny, the last few days, just cranking out a ton of content that we're going to start releasing on Instagram and YouTube and everything. So excited for that, man. Really excited. Yeah, that sounds that. awesome. So, well, I'm super excited. So what's been up with you, dude? Uh, you know, life has been good. My little cousin is in town, moved here from Italy, you know, so it's very interesting. As you know, I don't have kids. Uh, so it's very interesting that every eight to 10 years, I seem to take a teenager into our house and raise them for the last two years of high school. So it's, it's a very kind of like kind of backwards and, and took her to school. And it's so funny to see, you know, now that the world is so global, a lot of things are similar, but the American schools, like an American high school, it's completely different from any other school in the world, right? Like the size and the number of people and like, in Italy, you don't have like an entire football field. You don't have gigantic gyms. You don't have any of that, right? So just like they're walking around and seeing it. It was so interesting just to watch her, you know, like watching somebody witness life. It's always something so interesting to me. And then what's funny for me also, walking through the hallway of high school, they get to her orientation. It wasn't even my high school, but I was just like, oh, I hate, <laughs> I hate being <laughs> being back in these corridors it just feels so weird and it just like talks about like you know like going back to like our programming right it's just like a certain scenario puts you back as if you you never left you know what i mean so it was very interesting i was just like oh i feel terrible leaving there i was like what what is it you know and it's just like it's cool high school weird, it was weird, very weird. High, like, you know? yeah, high school vibes yeah, I didn't like it. All the mean girls and all the groups of people kind of felt like that. <laughs> mean girls. That's why I kept imagining in my mind, you know, and like Lindsay Lohan talking about like it looks like a jungle and there were all these kids running around. And I was just like, oh, it's spotty. So it's very interesting, you know. But like it's good, man. Mm. Yeah, what I was I'm excited too. What, what... For Rachel, because I, I missed it last time somehow. Um, so I'm super excited because she's. He's a power uh, yeah, I don't know how you missed it. I don't know if you were in Italy or something. I had we recorded know. episodes when you were in Italy, but anyway, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm excited too. So I was just with Rachel, whatever it was, two or three weeks ago out in Breckenridge. She had a couple of her students um, at that seven figure mastermind. We had a blast, and she covered some something that I haven't heard anybody else talk about, which is how to get bookings through insurance companies. So somebody's house burns down, there's a flood, there's an issue, and they need to relocate somebody to a property for a week, a month, two months, a year, whatever it is. And she's got the inside scoop on how to get in the know with like those insurance companies to actually get direct bookings that way. So wow. without further ado, Rachel, welcome back to the show. Excited to have you back for the second time around. Hey, thank you so much, Mike. And e, we finally meet 
virtually. I had the great right. pleasure of meeting you in Nashville, Nashville but it's so right. funny to see you here in the podcast studio. Um, just a pleasure, Mike. You're always putting out amazing content, you and E, in the STR Secrets podcast. Just such a value for the community. So thank you so much for what you do. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. And for just, we'll do a quick recap. So we'll put a link down in the show notes of, of the first episode that we had Rachel on because she really specializes in high-end luxury properties. Um, you know, her model is, you know, have the least amount of properties possible with the highest profitability, right? So it's very different than a lot of folks that are going after the volume game. They want 20, 40, 50, 100, 500 units. She wants to like, have a small portfolio with really high quality luxury properties that make the most amount of money. So it was a really good episode. Um, but why don't you give everybody kind of the 60 second rundown on your background and how you got into short term rentals and what you're up to now? Yeah. And so, Mike, I really wish that came from a place of innovation or, you know, an aha moment. But for me, it really was. Look, I'm a mom. I've got a whole husband, two kids, three dogs. How am I going to manage a, a side hustle like short term rentals in addition to my career in healthcare? And healthcare is something you go into not to retire at 40 or 41, right? You go into it for a lifetime. You imagine going into healthcare, a lot of us, since you're a itty bitty girl. And so when the burnout got real and I realized, okay, I have to do something else walking away from school with half a million dollars in student loans is not cute. And working my finger to the bone, my husband and I to pay it off was also not cute. So once we got on the other side of that, we said we need to find a way to accelerate our saving, accelerate our investment, accelerate our revenue. Uh, we looked at all of the real estate um, strategies and short-term rentals specifically in the luxury short-term rentals was it. And without, you know, trying to buy another job, uh, sticking to, you know, the higher end luxury, we realized that one or two could just strategically and uh, really elevate our our income and revenue. So that's why we went into short term rentals. I love that. I love that you said that your student loans were cute because yes, a half a million dollars in student loans, I wouldn't consider cute either. I just never heard anybody refer to student loans as like cute or ugly, you know, it's just it's such a funny thing. <laughs> And going back to kind of what I was saying at the intro, right? And I'm going to say this, I didn't get to say it last time. I find it so amazing that after all the work, because also like, you know, my, my dad is a doctor. We have doctors in the family. My little sister is, is in her path to go into medical school. And I know what you're saying, right? Like I know it's that like life calling. So it's very, it must have been a hard choice for you to choose to hang it out. You know what I mean? And, and do this by the same time. You know, you have a whole husband, you said, and you have two kids and you have dogs. So you're like, okay, maybe I should do something that is a little bit cuter with my time instead of continuously just hustling for nothing. So I love that story every time I hear it. So do you want to kind of lead us into how, because I've had insurance bookings in the past, but it's very much a kind of fall in my lap. I never like understood how to do it in a kind of consistent and systematized way. Strategic way. Yeah. Strategic way. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So just like anything else, e, it's the networking, right? And so as soon as I recognized that insurance was going to be one of the pillars of our strategy throughout, especially the suburban areas and within the vacation areas during the slower season, when we wanted to reposition and pivot, pivot our properties to host the insurance guests, I decided, you know what, I really need to figure out exactly how these insurance companies are finding us. So really starting those conversations with them, really trying to understand what it is that they are looking for, what it is that the guests are looking for in order to really position our properties that way. So having a lot of conversations getting the inside scoop, understanding the pricing, believe it or not, for the first few of our um, bookings, we actually were way underpriced where we needed to be. And so understanding the pricing is a big deal because ultimately you don't want to leave any money on the table, you know, and then really understanding what it is that is going to put you ahead of the pack, you know, whether it's placing the listing on sites 
other than Airbnb, because some of the larger insurance agencies in North America are not necessarily uh, keen on uh, looking for property on Airbnb based on, you know, the mandate they're given by their management. And so understanding some of those nuances, understanding why that change occurred and uh, then, you know, working with them and kind of catering to them, that's really what has placed us on the map and being bold. And, you know, people want to be told what to do sometimes. And so I tell them, hey, if you're ever looking for a space uh, in this zip code or in that zip code, I'm your girl, you know, put me on your list and, and just really marketing to them and keeping those lines of communications going. So whether it's an email, email marketing campaign, hey, by the way, we have uh, this listing that's coming up that's going to be available in a few days. So if you have anyone who is in need, keep us in mind. Uh, that is one of the uh, pillars within our marketing strategies towards the insurances. Interesting. So I, love that. I, I wrote down a couple questions and, and a lot of the questions are just based on my past experience. So on the price thing, what's well, funny is like most of the time I dealt with the, with the guests, they will find us and then tell us, we don't care what you charge. The insurance is not pay for it. That's kind of like a very simple way of how those conversations went. So do you normally get to talk to the insurance company directly and have you figure out kind of like a, like a recipe of what the prices should be or they give you guidelines? What does that look like? Yeah. So typically we deal with them directly, but we do deal with the guests. I would say 30% of the time uh, the guests reach out to us directly because mm -hmm. The conversation or the flow E is like this. Okay. Unfortunately, the guests may encounter some type of whether it's a natural disaster or an, you know, accidental disaster to their property. So mm -hmm. a fire, a blizzard, a hurricane, a store, uh, the property becomes inhabitable. They can't stay there. And so two things happen. The insurance places them in a hotel for a couple of days as they try to secure some type of temporary housing for those guests. Typically something uh, that is similar or within the guideline of what they're used to, because that mm -hmm. is what insurance is supposed to do is kind of keep you in a state of, you know, I would say, you know, stasis so that you're not experiencing additional trauma by being placed in a in a home or in a location that yeah. is completely outside of what you would expect and so, so a thousand square foot house can be put in a 1200 square foot apartment right right not necessarily in, right so in addition to everything else that has going in addition, on. exactly that exactly that wouldn't be ideal okay and there's probably some scenarios where that's probably one of the only options it's still better than one or two hotel rooms, right? Ultimately. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and that is the goal. So simultaneously, the insurance, uh, you know, I don't want to drop any brands, but you know, the big insurance providers, they all work through a third party temporary housing agency. And mm -hmm. that third party temporary housing agency starts looking for a place for that family, that individual to be relocated to simultaneously, they let the family know, hey, go ahead and uh, look for a place as well. If you know of a place or something that looks comfortable. So that's where it starts. So they're looking and the guest is looking as well. And sometimes both of them are reaching out to us simultaneously. So that's how that kind of happens. And how do you protect your calendar? Sorry, Mike, I know you were going to something. <laughs> okay. I asked her all these questions in Breckenridge, so now yeah. it's your chance. Yeah, that's funny, because like, how do you protect your calendar? Because that has been my last experience as an insurance person. I think his original claim was supposed to be two months, and I think he ended up staying six to eight. And then again, luckily for us, he had a two-bedroom two -bedroom condo. We put in one of our two-bedroom condos. We had 24 in the same location, so we were able to kind of and I moved the calendar around, but we had, ended up having to give him a hard out because season was coming. We're already kind of booked up, so we couldn't we couldn't do anything else. So how do you protect yourself with that? Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be 100% protected. You know, I would say 
we're able to hack it because not only do we have a few properties in the area like you do, um, but we also have resources and other short-term rental operators that we can work with uh, to make sure that, you know, that family gets to stay in a space that they're used to. We would prefer not to move them. So that is the goal. But yes, yeah, sometimes you do have to move them. So ideally, if they want to stay an extra 30 days, uh, it's the lease within the lease, we have kind of a 30 day notice to vacate. So although they're paying, you know, for their 30 day stay, we have the insurance secure uh, the next 30 days at the same time. So they have a 30 day notice to vacate. And if they decide to uh, stay longer, so by them paying for that additional 30 days, the calendar is blocked for them for the 30 days. So that helps, but it's not going to solve the world's problems per se. Uh, but we, we do recognize that a lot of times, depending on the level of damage, OK, because insurance, they want to be a little bit conservative with the calendar. They think, oh, it's going to take 30 days. Well, I know in my market, you know, if 50 percent of the house uh, has encountered a fire, it's not going to take 60 days. Uh, the vendors are uh, slower in this particular market. There was a supply chain issue. And I know that the insurance like the rate, I really like that rate. So I went ahead and blocked it off um, and I had conversations with those who uh, additional leads that were coming in. A lot of our units, I would say, is Instabook uh, off anyway. So I'm able to have those conversations because it's larger homes anyway. So I, I think I only have one property that's Instabook on, but everything else is Instabook off anyway. So. so if they need more than 30 days, you're signing some type of lease agreement. And does that go to, is that insurance company on the lease agreement or is it the actual person that's staying in the property? I know it's a technical question, but I was curious about that. Both. Okay. Both. So the payor is the insurance and then the actual uh, guest is on the lease. So both uh, are on the lease. Got it. And do you charge them like security deposits and stuff? Yes. I charge them both a refundable and a non-refundable security deposit. And because does insurance cover that or, or does it require the actual, actual guest to cover it? You know what? I've seen it done both ways. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it comes to me by way of the insurance. However, I believe the guest, uh, depending on the um, policy, the guest pays as well. So the insurance cuts us a check for it. Yeah, you got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's some of the pushback we've got in the past. Though, that we're not paying for that. It's part of our contract. And so like just for, for context, I guess, as far as how much of your booking volume is through traditional OTAs and standard bookings versus this? What do you think it is? Like, is this kind of a filler for your calendar or is this your primary and then you're filling it with the OTAs? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's market dependent. I would say in my properties that is more vacation rental market, it's going to be uh, the OTAs. Uh, it's going to be, we do have a direct booking site as well for vacationers, for those visiting family. But in my suburban market, it's 50-50. And wow. so I have 50% insurance and 50% uh, those coming in through the OTAs. Wow, that's that's a good percentage. E, you right are, are, yeah. you, yours is a little different, but like for the direct stuff and for like the tennis school and the snowbirds, you're kind of leveraging the OTAs to just fill your calendar, right? What were you direct yeah, for Solomon's Rice Small Park? I'm like, 76% direct. Okay, that's interesting. So the, the 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 insurance people that you met, so is that a rep for the entire area or you went to like a local BNI meeting and you just found the insurance guy there? How was, how did you find them? <laughs> yeah, so that's a great question. A good question, right? No, I love it. And to be honest with you, I have reached out to local insurance uh, adjusters and I haven't gotten any leads from them, mm. you know, and they, you know, they know that we're here. They say, yes, we'll definitely keep you in mind, but I haven't gotten any leads from them. And so we work with some of the larger providers in, you know, all of North America. We work with local providers as well. The local providers find us on the OTAs, but the national providers find us on 
other websites uh, like Corporate Housing by Owner. That's one that they use a lot, the national uh, providers. And so, no, it was not local BNI. It was more so of uh, initially finding us on the OTAs. And as soon as I found out that they, you know, were not going to be uh, sourcing properties on the OTAs any longer, we made sure that our, you know, listings were optimized that were uh, on the direct booking as well as on the corporate housing by owner uh, site. And those were the ways that we, they reached out to us. However, within any market, uh, there's going to be a solution, for instance, like Atlanta market, for instance, you know, there may be Atlanta temporary housing. So I would encourage everyone to just look at your local market to see who is offering temporary housing and, and make sure that you're connecting with them. But uh, those folks, they, they do leverage the OTAs and those folks, they do reach out. Awesome. Um, when you said optimizing for the corporate housing websites, what what have you found that it's it's kind of like a, a helpful either amenity or additional thing that you provide that makes your listing on a corporate housing website specifically, right? So I'm not talking about OTAs because OTAs we've talked about plenty, but on a corporate housing specific website, what are some of your optimizations that you have? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say I don't stray too much from uh, the copywriting or the photos from what we have on the OTA to what we have on the corporate site. So in order to optimize, you want to make sure that you highlight that you are hosting 30 night um, minimums uh, on those sites, although your OTA may be two night minimums. So on those sites, 30 night minimums are very much appropriate. You want to make sure that you're pet friendly. If you're in a location, some, some individuals, I understand you cannot be pet friendly, but if you can swing it, you must be pet friendly. If you're going to host individuals who are displaced from their homes, everyone loves foo-foo, you know, that's another baby in their family. And so if you're not hosting pets, you are leaving a lot of money on the table. So if it's from, you know, the point of view, well, I don't want the pet to mess up the property. I get it, but figure it out. You can do it. <laughs> um, uh, additionally, you just want to make sure that everything that the family would need for the home, you have them in mind, whether it's fully stocked kitchen with all the kitchen utensils, everything that they need to cook meals. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that that's there and that's available. And additionally, the copywriting, we love to tell people again what to do. Come and stay with us. Just bring your suitcase. We've got you covered. We love hosting um, guests who are displays, who need a place to stay temporarily, who are relocating, you know, some individuals, their house is being built also. And so that's another segment, but similar demographic. Additionally, we just we just want to make sure that they're aware that we are there. They're aware that we are servicing that clientele. And when the guest leaves a review after their stay and, you know, it's a guest who stayed multiple times, you can then comment within the review, you know, that public uh, listings, you, you can comment and add in, you know, a little bit more about the reason for their stay. Say so thank you, Mrs. Smith, so much for staying with us. Uh, we we loved hosting you while your home was being repaired. And they'll say in there, it's not that we're disclosing information. If they don't disclose it, you want to be kind of sensitive to it. But if they say, Rachel took care of us while our home was being repaired. Yes, this is a segment that we love hosting. Those who are getting their home repaired, we want you to just know that this is your home away from home. We'll take very good care of you. So that's what I mean by optimizing it. Anywhere there's an opportunity to write a little bit about that, we definitely uh, interject that in there. That's awesome. I'd be I'm, one thing I'm curious about because students ask me all the time, especially in markets where there's regulation that you have to do at least 30 day minimums. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to get data around that of? booking data or demand for that type of booking so that they'd feel a little bit more confident of like, okay, if I have to do these 30 day stays, what's like the demand for these longer stays at properties like this? I don't know if you found any type of data point, whether it's through AirDNA or anybody else that you can leverage to see if this would be a good fit for that type of booking. Yeah, that's a great question. It's something that I've actually thought about a few times um, and we're working on figuring that out. 
in terms of what market that there are fires, that there are blue, it's everywhere. It legitimately yeah. is everywhere. So that's not the question of whether or not this market is going to have a house fire. I didn't realize how many house fires happen in my own backyard. It's like, why is everyone's house burning down? Like, why? What happened? My son's friend's house burned. It's like everyone's house is burning down. It's incredible. So it's not whether or not there's going to be a disaster that causes displacement. It's rather whether or not the asset that you have is going to be an ideal asset for catering to those who are moving. And so mm -hmm. here's the deal. If you are in a market where there are a lot of corporate apartments that are, you know, two bedroom furnished, uh, you know, they already come furnished or one bedroom, they already come furnished, right? If that asset is there and there's a plethora of that asset, the insurance company already has an end with that REIT or that real estate investment trust, that big apartment like a Camden or like those big apartments. They already have that relationship with the one bedroom. OK, so if they're moving a person from a one bedroom to another one bedroom, they're going straight there. I mean, it's clockwork. They, they've got that figured out. It's when you have a three bedroom, it, you know, it's when you have a four bedroom, it's when you have a five bedroom in these suburban areas, that's not going to be something that's easy to find. You can't just copy paste that into, you know, th that particular situation. And so I think that's what kind of drives it, you know, understanding the population of an area, understanding the demographics of an area. Is this an area where there's a lot of families, multi-generational families staying in a large home? Or is it an area where it's just seniors who are, you know, condoing it out? You know, so I think I'm leaning more towards that type of analysis. We're still analyzing that because this is an area that I'm really interested in. But what I've found, again, it's more of the asset rather than the area because there are disasters <laughs> in all areas, really. Mm -hmm. Some worse than others, of course. Like if you're in a tornado alley, I'm thinking about that, right? If you're in a tornado alley, if you're, you know, Oregon, all the fires, all of those people, think about that. All of those people needed some type of housing. And are they going to place a family of eight in a hotel? Are they going to be comfortable, right? What type of house does a family of eight need, right? They may have a seven bedroom home. Well, we may not have a seven bedroom home, but we have a five bedroom home. You know, that's still going to work out, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. really a heads to beds game at that point. We had a room that we had to stuff three bunk beds, you know? Or like, you know, it was like a big bonus room. We just kept bringing in beds and they were just so happy to be out of a hotel because when the mom said, imagine cooking for a family of 10 in a hotel. Impossible. Not I don't even how you do it. <laughs> in a microwave, <laughs> eight microwaves lined up on the, on the counter. It's crazy. And it's super interesting just overall the line of, of where you're thinking, right? Because I'm like, as I'm listening to you, I've never had a fire. Uh, client, but I did have a lot of like leaks and pipe burst and windows and mold. Obviously, in Florida, that's that's more yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting what you said also about going in areas where there is a higher likelihood. The thing that scares me here, and you say, I'm like, well, how do I know that my house is gonna be protected, right? Because I'm like, if I'm in a tornado alley, either I find a very good shaman somewhere that can put like a protection on my house so i'm like guaranteed that everything else is gonna be leveled out and then our house is there i'm like awesome i'm the only show in town uh but i do love what you say because anyways it's the the money is in the niches right so this is such a small niche and if you just find that the the one or two in especially if you have a smaller portfolio of property like if you have yeah like i do nice <laughs> factory houses mm -hmm. you might need one or two insurance insurance connections plus the OTAs and you'll be you'll be all golden. Um does the corporate housing website I wrote one down the euro corporate housing by owner does that website uh sync to your property management software or do those calendars not sync? Like are they kind of friendly towards the PMSs or how does that work? No, thank you for asking that question. So that is a great question because here's the deal that website is more of a lead gen website. You have to get on the phone. It's not one of those that are like, they don't the go direct. Yeah. 
Now it's just a conversation and you know how insurance is. It's always a conversation anyway, even if it's on the OTA, it's a lot of conversations before, you know, uh, you can get things to happen typically. So yeah, they, um, they do not sink as far as I know, unless something happened last week, I haven't checked it in week. <laughs> but no, they do not. Sink. No, I'm sure. I'm sure they're, they're slow kind of progressing because every time <laughs> I've been on one of those, I'm like, why, <laughs> why would I want to be on this platform? Like is is a platform from the sixties. Like, it's just like that typical, like it almost has the same level of, of of technology as the municipality, of, like the the like life census office that you just like yeah clunky yeah I'm like who, who did this for you guys <laughs> so why funny. are these pictures so terrible right so that's super cool and so are you looking now to so what's 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 in the future for you and I'm sorry I wasn't in things I don't know if this is <laughs> no. but I'm sure you got a lot a lot of plans in the works. Yeah, so I'm still building. We have a new construction on the beach in Rosemary Beach. So we're building that out. We're hoping to open our doors before the end of the year. And, you know, I'm trying to be like you guys and look at boutique hotels. I've always been intrigued. So whenever Mike has something to say about it, I'm all ears because I think that's just such a cool strategy. If I can find something on the beach, I have a vision of it, you know? <laughs> So we'll see how that goes. But I'm I'm more of a one project at a time girl, you know. I just do I'll do one or two a year and I just kind of slowly, you know, it's my way up. You, you know, when you get trained so long to be like, you can't multitask or somebody <laughs> might die on your table. So let's <laughs> let's focus on on one thing at a time. Let's make sure one thing at a time. good. Like you know, you know. But that's the other thing, like I am I am more and more wary. And again, like obviously the different seasons in life make this conversation easier. And if you're listening to this and you're in the early kind of like really hungry moment in your life, don't take what I'm saying to heart. But it's just like, it's better to say no to the majority of things. Majority mm -hmm. of people, majority of partnerships, majority of opportunity, majority of invites also just say no. And like, honestly, you feel lighter. And like everybody has so much stuff going on right now. And like the, the shamanic joke about the protection, it's it's a joke. But if you have hang out with me in the past, you know that it's really not a joke, right? So also like people are so the money situation, the recession situation, it's really this moment in life that you gotta say no and you gotta protect your bubble. Because in this moment, in this next six to twelve months, you can rapidly change your life. Or you gotta be careful of what your inner circle looks like and who's around you. And we really learn how to say no and like really be committed to the 1% growth, which maybe it is one house a year, maybe yes. it's two houses a year, but like just enjoy it and say no, because a lot of the times you're saying yes anyways, out of lack, out of scarcity, out of fear. So just say no. Or just out of not having clarity, right? Like that's what I love about Rachel's strategy. It was, it was very clear that like, so clear. I'm going to so focus clear. on like higher end properties, less volume to replace a high W2 earning job, which she's now done. So it's like, okay, cool. You know, mission accomplished. I don't need to race to 50 properties, especially since that's not even my goal. So it's like, yeah, I'll just keep chugging. My income will keep going up. My net worth will keep going up. I'll add one to two properties a year and maintain the lifestyle that I want to have. And, you know, now she's teaching other people how to do it. And I know she loves doing that because we've been hanging out for a while now. And, you know, she's got a community and coaching programs and all this stuff. So it's like, yeah, like I don't need to add 50 doors or even 10 doors at a time. I'm just going to keep adding my one or two nice high-end properties and teaching other people how to do it. So I love that, you know? No, I appreciate that. And, but you know what E was just saying too, it speaks to me even within, you know, getting into communities and connecting E. So I'm trying to flex my no, my no muscles. Oh, it is so hard. It's exactly. uh, it, it's really tiring. And like, honestly, I, I went to this a couple of years ago and, and I was just a junkie of, of everything it was personal development, conference, Me too. Books, and podcasts, <laughs> things. And then like my, my mentor coach at the time was like, you need to stop. Like you need wow. to just level out because again, like the problem is this, this over information yeah. life and time that we're on. It's amazing, but it's also the worst possible time for you to be because you don't know that 
you just see the covers of people's lives. You don't know their their book. Maybe it has a beautiful cover, but the book is literally one page thin. And you're freaking out because the cover is so gorgeous and shiny. And you're like, I want that. Yeah. The guy has no book in it. There's no story. There's nothing. He has, hasn't done anything else. Or it's there because it's the last page of his book. And you're a 22-year-old hungry guy or hungry girl that's been listening to podcasts for the past 12 months. You're like, why don't I have that? Don't, don't worry about it. You know what I mean? Like, choose your path, plant your seeds, have faith. 1% better every day. You know? There's only one way to eat an elephant, right? Yeah. You're right. I love that. The bite um, crap, So, The last thing that I wanted to make sure that we cover, because I know we're coming up on time here, was you mentioned at the beginning that the pricing strategy was a little different. So how do you, how do you navigate that? Because it's not just like, oh, whatever Price Labs tells me I should do, I'm going to charge them, right? So it's a little more of like a, a song and dance or a different approach to come up with the pricing and then justify the pricing to those insurance companies, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so if you're an individual who really wants to get into hosting the insurance client and the insurance comes to you now there, uh, or the third party rather temporary housing company comes to you, their uh, goal is to um, move in a family. I actually took a look at one of their metrics boards uh, a few days ago and I saw on their blackboard, it was Seven families moved in today. I was like, aha. So they're, they're looking at how many move-ins, you know, that they get into your properties. And so uh, when it comes to the policyholder, what I learned is that when you have an insurance that is pretty good, it's pretty robust, you know, uh, those insurance companies will allot anywhere from 25% to 30% of the property value in temporary housing funding. What? Okay, let's for those sitting in the back, 25% to 30% of the property value in insurance temporary housing allotment. So what that means is when that family calls you e and they're saying, "Hey, I need, you know, temporary housing for 30 nights and all of that." And your question is, "Oh no, what happened?" So what I'm doing is I'm gathering information when I'm asking what happened. Oh no. And you have how many people you have Fufu too? Oh, you live at such and such street on such and such row, which is the high end area in that neighbor. And it's a seven bedroom. Oh my goodness. Your house. But I'm doing the numbers on the side. And I'm like, shh, 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 shh. like, like, that's it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Your thousand. <laughs> Builder grade countertops in the bathroom or what kind of countertops? <laughs> what kind of handles you had? Oh, gold plated handles. Perfect. Oh my God. I'm so sorry for you. I'm so sorry for those handles because we're, oh <laughs> we're about to do some pricing. Right. So if you understand that, and that's why I like, again, purchasing homes in a little bit of that higher end area, it doesn't have to be millions of dollars, but you know, if it's a little bit of the higher end area, and they're in the million dollar row, I'm like in the $700,000 row, I already know what's going on, right? So say um, the house's property value, which we all know went all the way up, right? Um, <laughs> over the last few months is $800,000. So that's $200,000 available for temporary housing uh, per claim per 12 months. So each claim they can, every year if something terrible happens, heaven forbid, they can claim $200,000 worth of temporary housing per claim. Yeah. Gotcha. So we're going to go a little fast here because I know we're on top of time. So going back to the questions in the gathering, right? So you're like, okay, it's that $800,000 house. You're like, it's okay, $200,000 in the back of my mind. And then how do you gauge that price? Because because I already know, I already see you now, right? I see you on <laughs> phone here, calculator on this side, and you run through the thing, and you're trying to gauge anybody that has direct bookings. There is that fine line of gauging the person you're talking to and knowing how much you can push the price. Because sometimes you can talk to two people, and I can tell how much I can push my price versus how how conservative I should be, right? So now you know there's a two hundred thousand dollars for twelve months per occurrence. How do you gauge how much you charge them? 
based on how long they're going to stay. So you say, okay, knowing previous experience, this reno will take six months. So I'm going to divide this 200,000 by six months. And that's what I'm going to quote them. Well, I, I look at three things. So that's one of the things I look at. The second thing I look at is how much would it cost them to stay at the Marriott for six months? Mm -hmm. And we're renting out three, four bedrooms. So I have that number there also. And then, oh, you have Fufu and, and Fifi. How much does it cost to board two dogs? Because everyone has two or three for six months. I'm going to call the local um, kennel to find out that price. So now we can have a conversation, right? So if they mm -hmm. want to lowball me, I may not go all in the full amount, but I'm going to be somewhere around that. Mm -hmm. And and that's the type of conversation that I have with uh, those individuals. And if they want to push back, go ahead and push back. But here's the deal. We can lock this rate in right now for the whole time because we're about to hit peak season and prices are going up. Or you can shop around and then call me back in two weeks because. Go shop around. <laughs> no. happened to you. Go shop around, honey. Go. I'm going to charge you more money when you come back. No, Ray, I, I love it. I mean, I knew you were, you were as, as they would say, up in Boston, wicked smart, but I, I had no idea that part of it was through insurance. I've always loved them. It's just never been an avenue that I've been able to like really pursue on a consistent basis, but similar, similar, similar to Noble, right? It's like, you guys have found your little, your little corner and like the crumbs in this little corners are, are, can be quite chunky. And just you guys are making a killing with this. I love it. And I just, I just never would have thought that that would be a niche, especially for the kind of properties that Rachel has. You know, I mean, they're like high end luxury properties. Like I would have never connected those two dots. But when you think about it, it makes absolute sense. Somebody that has a million and a half dollar six bedroom house, you know, 4,000 square feet, 5,000 square feet, whatever it is, like if they need to relocate them, they're not going to put them in some extended stay cheap motel or whatever like that that's not going to fly so it makes total sense but i never connected those two dots until we were talking in breckenridge and i was like wow that makes total sense so lights out per usual rachel appreciate okay. you coming on um before we get into the last question i just want to acknowledge you and again thank you for coming on here and adding a ton of value per usual um, but where can the listeners learn more about you and short-term gems and uh, all the good stuff that you got going on? Yeah. Awesome. And thank you again for having me guys. What a fun conversation. I love this conversation. <laughs> Just putting the word out, you know, there are other ways to leverage our short-term rentals and I know it's going to serve and help someone today. Uh, you can find me on Instagram. I am under short.term.gems. You can find me there. And I do have a resource of freebie, 75gems.com. That's 75gems.com. That's the 75 cities that I'm looking at right now in 2022 that I've identified that has some of the highest profitability for short-term rentals. So check out that free resource. But again, thank you. Thank you guys for having me. This was a whole lot of fun. Our <laughs> pleasure. Our pleasure. So the Last question that we ask all of our guests, and maybe your answer has changed, but what is your number one secret to success with short-term rentals? Ooh, for me, and I think it has changed, it's who, not how. <laughs> so yeah, I'm all in on who, not how in every aspect of my life, honestly. So trying to figure out who's the best individual to help me get to that next level, whether it's um, someone who's assisting me in the STRs, someone could, who could help with the listings, a, a better cleaner or whatever it is. Um, it's looking for the who and not always trying to figure out how to do it myself. So who, not how. Love it. Well, Dr. H, again, thank you so much for coming on here. Truly appreciate you. All the listeners out there, thank you guys so much. Truly appreciate all you guys. Make sure you guys Follow the podcast, download it, share it with a friend that's looking to grow their short-term rental business, and we will see you guys next week. Hey, STR Nation, if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. And in the comments, let us know what topics you want us to cover on upcoming episodes, and we'll make sure to get that in the books for you. And if you really want to learn how to launch, automate, and scale your short-term rental business, if you want to go deeper, then check out our free masterclass at strsecrets.com.